This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm Sam Mercier's. I'm Nate Blyton. And I'm Dave McDonald. And this week, we're happy to bring back friend of the show, Daniel Felsenfeld. Daniel's a composer, pianist, New York City resident. Anything else? Um, no. <laughs> no other excellent titles? You're not a knight of any kind? That's right. Not yet. <laughs> well, we'll, we will be talking about a knight later on. Yes. Absolutely. Um, that's, so, that's, what we call, that's what we call peerage pressure. Right. <laughs> yeah. I've copyrighted that joke. You can't use it. <laughs> well, we can. We just have to pay you 35 yeah. cents. I'll look. I'll check the mail. Right. Right. <laughs> so what's new in your life, Danny? Um, well, I just did the weirdest thing I've ever done, uh, which is one of those bizarre side projects that every composer should do just to get out of the, I don't know if it's high art or low art or whatever the hell we do world, but um, I just did all of the orchestrations and arrangements for Jay-Z's Carnegie Hall concert. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> which took up a lot of time, and there is plenty available of it on YouTube. Um, yeah. Even though it's not legal, but I shouldn't be even saying that. No, they. I guess American Express put up a bunch of clips, so you can actually see Jay Z in action. And I defy you to hear a note of what I did, just because it, it kind of got swallowed in the sound. Okay. But there is an orchestra; they are playing my arrangements. That's sort of the thing I did for a while. Cool. Uh, so cool. I'm curious about what the process. Did you get sheet music, <laughs> or did you just say they no. gave you a bunch of tracks and said, here, make orchestral parts that go with this? Or Yeah, a bunch of tracks. You've got to take it all off the record. So you had a lot of artistic license to make those tracks sound the way you wanted them to sound. Well, no, not necessarily. You have a lot of license to make it sound kind of like a bigger version of the record. Right. right. Okay. You know, I mean, it wasn't like they said, do a Fantasia on... on this <laughs> uh, right. It doesn't sound like they, a word they would use. Like, they, and it, and it's and it's a visual thing as much as it is an, an oral thing, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but it's the truth. Like it's a it's a sure. It's a visual effect having uh, having uh, all the orchestra playing. You know, it looks great. You can see in the right. YouTube videos, it looks kind of amazing and fantastic. And Jay Z looks great, and the lighting design is absolutely incredible. Like it's a package deal. Right, right. And the right. orchestra's part of that package. And, and yeah, it, was, that. it was it was it was intense though. Was like That's really, something that pop music is really good at. We should be better at that, I think, as as non pop musicians. But that... making a making a full package. Yeah. Well, it has a there's there's a there's place a for it. Thing about it. Yeah. Sure. You know, Do you their think budget that... is a little is a little uh, less more robust than most of ours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Do you have different feelings now about Jay Z's music after having gone through that process? Um, you know, I I I didn't start off as a as a fan, and I didn't. I'm not going to say I didn't end up there because I have I gained uh, a fair amount of respect for him, um, yeah. but I will say that even even as a fan, not a fan, whatever, I got the very bizarre opportunity to like sit about ten feet from him while he wrapped his entire set and into a microphone, and I could hear him in analog. Like I, hmm. I heard him the rapping coming out of him rather than coming out of the speakers. Right. And yeah. I, I might be one of the few people on the planet that can actually say that. It's a weird. Yeah. It's a weird yeah. uh, testament, and he was he was great and gracious, and like you know, I, I got nothing bad to say about him. He right. was he was really, it was a pressure cooker, but that kind of thing is always a pressure cooker. Right? How did you get yeah. connected with a, a, a project like that? <coughs> I'm just curious. I worked with the Roots oh. on a project a yeah. couple years ago, and um, and Amir, who, who's better known as Quest Love, was the drummer for for that event, and he 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 was not just the drummer; he put. He put everything together, and I think he did, had a lot of things in picking the songs that weren't Jay Z's, and you know, like the Roots like to to just run their shows together. They don't stop, right. which is one of the great things about going to a Roots show is it is relentless. And, um, yeah, and he wanted he wanted uh, he wanted that kind of feeling for this too. So so uh, Amir assembled all of it. So I got it through him. He is a fantastic drummer. Boy, is he. Uh. <laughs> and and not just a great drummer, but he's a great musician. Like, right. he's got a great set of ears. He knows literally every song ever written. Like, he is he's the real thing. <laughs> like, there is nothing for show about Amir. He is he's truly like a like a, a a brilliant musician, not just a brilliant drummer. Mm. Um. If so, Danny, we haven't 
we haven't talked to you since before your big um, 9-11 anniversary. Yeah, Music After was oh, going yeah. to happen. Um, I mean, we were able to discern from our man on the man on the street in New York, Patrick, and from reading about it that things went well. But I wonder if you have some perspective on it now that it's gone by a little ways. Patrick, you were there, right? I was. Yeah, yeah I, I know that day was. It's kind of like my wedding. Like I know I remember talking <laughs> to people, but super vaguely. Um, I yeah, thought you, it went. You were like a chicken with very, your head very cut off. Well. I mean, like again, it was. It's such a bizarre event because. It's not about me at all, and you know I'm a composer, and everything is supposed to be about me. Um, right. But it, like it, it was a it was a really beautiful experience to have. Um, I think we had 56 composers represented, and like hundreds of people playing. And I mean, a lot of people were were super generous with their time and their energy and their efforts. And um, and the Joyce Theater was an incredible place to work. And it was, and I, I thought. We had a couple of mishaps, you know, like two people got sick and, we, you know, we had to like, at the last minute, Dave Cawson got really ill. Like he kept texting me like he was trying to leave his house and had food poisoning. He was going to do his like one man um, piano phase. Oh, yeah. Oh, <clears throat> so man. we had mm. at the end of the night, we realized we had no Steve Reich represented on this concert, which was uh -oh. to us a huge omission. So we had to like at 11 o'clock at night play a recording of Steve Reich, which felt better than nothing. Uh, but yeah. you know, like we had a, uh, my friend Nicole Atkins, who's a great singer songwriter, was going to come down and sing um, some David Byrne and The Strokes and Patty Patty Smith, and she got really sick. Like we had mishaps, but yeah. those aside, I thought the thing went very, very, very well. Yeah, I mean, considering like, I the, the number of musicians you were working with, it seems like <laughs> you, could, you couldn't get that many people of any stripe together without a few people having hiccups like that. Right. It would have been weird to have it go so smoothly, but right. considering it went, considering there was a lot of backstage tumult, it, I thought on stage was very smooth and and um, and it was full most of the day. I mean, we started at like nine or eight forty-five in the morning, mm -hmm. and um, I would say it was half full at eight forty-five, which is pretty good, and at uh, at at nine forty at like not at eleven o'clock at night, um. It was half full again, but it was full the rest of the day. People were waiting in line. Like, um, it was just great. And again, we didn't charge for tickets, so it's not like I'm saying we made a bunch of money. Right. <clears throat> and, um, and what was the? It was, it was a, and I feel like all the composers uh, were represented well, and and I'm I'm sure we missed people, and mm. I'm sorry about that. But for the most part, I thought it felt like um, a real community thing, and I don't feel you don't feel that that often in, in New York. In yeah. My experience. A community coming together as a community, and it really was great. Yeah. And, and did you get any feedback from the, the the performers or the composers or the audience on what they how they Every, thought everybody, of it? Was, everybody was really kind. Everybody was really happy. Um, you know, like you know, I can't. Even, I, everybody's like, so what was your favorite thing? And I honestly couldn't pick one because I felt like you know Blair McMillan playing uh, Elliot Carter at nine thirty in the morning was yeah. sort of incredible and also uh roseanne cash at the last minute deciding she would happily sing a song or two was also incredible um cool. so you know you can't it was, it was a day that just you, i couldn't pick a favorite and it was you know and again it was one of those weird days because it's somewhere between a concert and a funeral and a memorial and you can't mm -hmm. really pin it down and we asked for uh for no reviews because it felt i felt weird yeah. i didn't want my performers who were dinner most of whom were donating their time or were certainly working for way less than they are, were worth um, to also feel the pressure of the New York times breathing down their neck. Right. Sure. So, you know, it didn't get, it didn't get a lot of, uh, it didn't get so I can't say oh, well reviewed because we didn't want it to be. I mean, I did see a number of listings in different publications <laughs> yeah, in New York. You so. can list it, you can write about it. You can, I mean, you are welcome to come. Obviously it's not a no press event. I just didn't want a standard, you know, Day after, right. I don't see the point in having it. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Do you think something like this will happen again? And not, if it does, it will not be by me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I loved every second of putting it together, and I actually mean that. Um, I loved working with Eleanor Sandresky. She's a great friend and a great collaborator. Um, but, and it's the, it's really the only concert I've produced. Mm -hmm. So I feel like. What am I going to do? A seventeen-hour concert next? Like I feel like I've kind of gone to some kind of incredible maximum with the producing thing. Yeah, and it's not 
some people have that and some people don't. And I don't feel like I do. So next time, I hope somebody else picks this up and does this every year, and I will happily attend. Uh, but uh, I don't think it will be me doing it. Maybe we'll have this conversation in nine years and I'll be saying something. Right. <laughs> what can happen in a decade? <clears throat> That's true. So, Danny, do you have any uh, live performances coming up uh, around town anytime soon? Um, nothing. Actually, I don't have anything for a while. I have a uh, on April 12th at the Cell Theater. This is kind of oblique but exciting. I have a, a reading of a libretto that I'm going to be setting to music. Interesting. So, uh, it'll be at the Cell Theater, and this director, Kira Simring, is going to stage a reading of it so we can hear it on its feet. And I'm writing this, this opera called The Inner Circle, um, which is based on the T.C. Boyle book about Dr. Kinsey. Um, I was thinking cool. about calling it Dr. Sec, but Dr. Atomic. Because <laughs> yeah. um, the title Dr. Atomic has already been taken. Right. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I think it's a great idea for an opera. And I'm going to be writing this for a group called Opera on Tap, and they're going to be touring it around. So that's the next thing I have coming up is, uh, is that. That'll be an interesting I'm, staging. Opera on Tap. <laughs> you know um, Opera on Tap? Opera on Tap, it's funny. Uh, when I'm not being a world-famous podcaster, my day job <laughs> right now is fixing saxophones. Um, and working with me is a guy who is from Ypsilanti, Michigan, Ko Gaiden, and he is uh, a big wig in uh, Opera on Tap Ann Arbor. I just did a finale project <laughs> where I transposed some piano pieces down so that he could sing them. Wow. Yeah, it's funny. All I, the opera on tap. Right. Well, I just I had thought that we should figure out a way to mention opera on tap on the show because I'm not the hugest opera fan, generally speaking, but it seems like a cool organization. They are. And, uh, they are a spectacular. They, um, I'm really thrilled. I've worked with them a bunch, and I'm looking forward to working with them more, um, especially yeah. on this big. And they're commissioning two operas, one of which is mine for these roadworks. Uh, series, which is where they're going to take it, I think, to Ann Arbor and to L.A. and to do it in New York and do it at all the opera on tap locations, these small, these chamber operas that will tour, kind of like on the Benjamin Britten touring opera model. Right. And just to, so people, will, if you're completely unfamiliar, it's sort of like a network. It's sort of like you have an opera on tap franchise in your city. <laughs> and yeah, so they, interesting. Ann Arbor, Ypsilanti, Atlanta, Boston, Chicago, Colorado, Los Angeles, New Orleans, New York, North Texas, San Francisco, Seattle, the Twin Cities, and one they call Latino. I'm not really sure what that one means. I don't know where that is. <laughs> it's in Latino. It's yeah. in Latino. <laughs> uh, it's California. It's uh, it's Los Angeles. So. Okay. And maybe it's a uh, you know a Spanish language version of something like this i don't know but anyway what what they what they do uh is that they are very they're a very sort of flexible organization and it's a lot of you know in new york and, and san francisco and places like that you, you have all these amazing singers who are probably underutilized because there are so many that and uh, and so they 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 do they do an opera new opera series at galapagos here um, and they do uh, a lot of things at Barbez, which is a little bar in, in Brooklyn. Um, and they do just kind of like rough and tumble opera nights. They're really fun and drink. Yeah. And, and it's it's Sounds kind great. of the opposite of, of what everybody's idea of, of opera is. I've, I've curated for them, and they've done a bunch of my music. I curated a whole night of art songs about vice, um, <laughs> which was really fun and really kind of sexy and strange. I think I might do something like that again with them. Like it's really, they just, they are willing to, to, to not be that kind of big opera cliche that a lot of opera can get really easily. Yeah. Well, yeah, well in, in the same way, we talk a lot about alt classical or indie classical, getting their music into smaller venues where you can have alcohol and this kind of thing. To me, that seems to be what opera on tap is doing with opera. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's not, it's not, um, it's not trying to change the music and it's not right. trying to, it's not trying to say now we will write operas that exist in these settings because I have a lot of trouble with, with sometimes with opera, with classical music in bars because it's sort of not built for that kind of setting. Right. So as much as like Jay-Z at Carnegie Hall, it's just musically not, musically not conducive to that kind of thing. Um, and it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, an attempt to like keep something out of something. It's like, you know, when you're competing with a cash register and, 
somebody taking an order, it's difficult to have music that is anything other than loud, you know, right, because right. that, that will lo you will lose half of it. If you have, and I, we all know this, every composer knows this pain, right? Of having, having a piece played in one of these kind of locations. And it's exciting to say, I got a piece played in a bar um, or a, or a club or something like that. But then, mm -hmm. then you, you can't hear half your piece because it's quiet and the bar is loud. Even if it's amplified, it's a, it's a difficult thing. So I think Opera on Tap takes that, rather than try to adjust the music, they try to adjust the intent of the of the performance. So it, it, it is very shaggy in, in the best sense. Uh, and it is very loose. And people kind of get a sense of, you get you just get talented people kind of doing what they're, they do very well without a lot of pressure. Yeah, I, and I think cool. opera could do themselves a favor. The world of opera could do itself a favor in general by trying to take away the feeling of going to church that I think probably people <laughs> associate with going to well, see an I, opera. I like going to that church when I want to go to that sure. church. I, I mm -hmm. love that church. But I also don't think everything has to be that church. That's correct. Right? Like, I, yeah. I, I love going to see a big, sacred cow opera at the Met. <laughs> that's, a, that's a specific experience. It's like seeing Bruce Springsteen in a stadium. You know what I mean? That's also right. a specific experience. Um, and sometimes I don't want that. You know, I love the fact that you, you should be able to have, especially in New York or, or L.A. Or, or San Francisco, you should be able to have all the kinds of experiences. Right. You know, like there's some talented people around. That you should be able to go to a bar and hear people singing arias as much as you can hear Nick Trebko sing those arias in context at, at, in expensive gowns. You know, I have no yeah. problem with either. Well, that's that's really interesting. I'm glad we glad you told us about that one. Um, so that's that's. I mean, that's that's the next. Thing. I have a bunch of stuff coming in up, up in October, but that's not for a while. So we'll, we'll, we'll have to that. have you on to talk about those things in October. <laughs> I'm in. Awesome. That sounds good. So, Danny, on the uh, on the show, we've talked about composition contests a couple of different times, and I am no fan of composition <laughs> contests. Usually, I was. I don't think that we've gotten your perspective on this. Well, I mean, I. I I, I'm no fan of them either, and I, I usually think the people who are fans of composition contests are the people who tend to win the composition contests. <laughs> they know how to write um, pieces and, and that I, win those contests. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I've been a judge of a lot of them. I spent, I've judged for three years running like the ASCAP Morton Gould, like the big ASCAP competition, right? Mm -hmm. So there's five of us or four of us or three of us in a room. We get anywhere between seven and 900 scores. We have three days to... to I'm in the baby room, where then we pass them on to the really famous composers, and they make the <laughs> final decisions. So I've got plausible deniability on, on, the, <laughs> on, on the judge level. Um, right. But obviously, it is impossible. It is impossible to rate these things on merit, potential, talent, any of those, any of those things that we would love these things to be rated on. It's mm -hmm. just impossible. There's no way. There's too much talent out there. There's too much merit. There's too many good composers out there. So something else has to stick out for you. Maybe it's a yeah. style, maybe it's a pedigree or something. And I'm not, I, I, I think I'm a fair judge. I like, yeah. to, I like to, you know, pat myself on the back and say, wow, you're a very fair judge. So how thing. do you feel you stay objective in that kind of situation? <clears throat> you can't. There is no way to be objective. It's, it's just impossible. So a contest is automatically an unobjective thing. Like yeah. you're submitting to something that it is not going, it's not a lottery. Especially you know, something like or, Morton Gould, where you submit a, a recording as well. Like so many people yeah. have great pieces that they just don't have the opportunity even to have a great performance, <laughs> much less a great recording of that performance. Well, I mean, um, I, I have an opinion about that too, in that part of being a composer is is rounding up your best recording, right? Right. So oh, sure. it's better to submit a, a a a good recording of a solo piece, say, than a than a mediocre MIDI recording of your your grand orchestral piece. But even even that said, I hope we can hear through that, but obviously it is impossible. So, yes, the people with a little more opportunity or money or at a better school or whatever can, can get an edge in these things. And I don't think there's any mystery in that. It's very, it's like, I don't think it's, it keeps being a surprise to lots of people that these things are not strictly based on the merit of the raw music. You know, that yeah, said, I, 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 I find so. any decision made by committee is a bad decision <laughs> you know like it's right. just it's just almost impossible because especially with something like art you know you got you know two guys you got three opinions right on, right. on the topic and and obviously people want to put forth their own ideas or mm -hmm. make sure they're on the right track 
or something like that. And I don't, I don't think it's as bad as people think. I don't think it's like, you know, I've, we've all heard the stories and I think they're partially true of like somebody screaming because some minimalist piece made it or some non-minimalist piece made it or whatever. You know, we all hear these stories, but on the whole, like competitions get you to the middle. You know, and they're and they're good for money and they're good for performances and they're good for like, you know, they're good for the composer who wins and they are bad for the composers who lose. And, you know, so the people who win the competitions and we all know who they are and they do very well. And you win one and then you win another and then you win another and they get to write. I won this competition. And at some point the lights go down and the music starts and you everybody hopefully will judge on that. Right. Right. Yeah, so I, I, I got to say, I read it. I read an article. I read that article about second performances of of choruses chorus pieces did we read this article yeah it was yeah. Uh, in the new, uh, new music box this week it was it in new music box i, I thought it was. it was i think it was... I, I, no, I definitely read it oh. um but they kept mentioning everybody who won everybody who they talked to they kept mentioning what awards they had won and i'm like wow is that the only thing that gives them credibility is having won an adventurous programming award or having won this new york times rave or something like that and i guess the the article was there to say these are the people that are actually doing this, and therefore you should listen to them. But it, it seems like a sad way to judge anything. You know, and, and so that's my opinion on, on competitions. I don't think it's necessarily evil. Um, I wish there were less of them, and I wish we made less hay of them. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, I, they're, they're not going anywhere. I'm afraid. That's no. true. And my feelings are like, I think they're kind of silly, but if a student were to say, should I enter this competition? I would probably say yes, you know? Because, like I you mean, said, at the very least, they under they're going to understand that at the barest minimum that they have to have the most beautiful score they can make, and they have to have the best recording they can get their hands on, which is a good exercise to go through. Well, it also gets people in the habit of putting things in the mail. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and like on a certain time, getting somebody that thing that they need, which I think is not a bad habit to get in because I sure, like when I was a student, I vowed never to enter any of these competitions because I I was you know very adamant that they were corrupt and worthless and and, th and they got your thinking uh to be poor like you started thinking about what won competitions mm -hmm. and i was i felt like i was not developed enough as a composer to even have that as a as a, as a backstage issue so i i just didn't enter them and uh, i feel like i missed out on an opportunity to like get in the habit of like putting a score and recording in the mail on the right day yeah just practice for commission work yeah because that's what you do as a composer. You know, you send your music to people. You know, besides right. writing. <laughs> and I yeah. also think it's valuable to recognize the people that are doing good good work. Um, for people that, for whatever reason, may not know about them, it's good to point at somebody and say, this person's doing good stuff. You should listen to that. Yeah. Um, I mean, so and again, for the people who win, they're great. Right. Um, and the reason we started talking about this is that uh, there's a contest going on right now. Parma Records um, is is running a student composition contest. Um, it is for people under 30 who are current students, so nobody on this show. Um, Damn it. But, I know, right? <laughs> um, and unlike a lot of recordings Parma does, the winners do not have to pay to get their works recorded. But Parma's starting a series of... Uh, compilations uh of different kinds of compilations um and this is going to be the first in a, a series of, of student composer compilations um that they're going to put together so i don't know is this something that, that you guys think is, is an interesting idea or I, I think it's an interesting idea because you get if you win you get a lot more than just a performance out of it they get they subsidize the cost of making a professional recording with the performers, the production costs, everything, and then it gets distributed for free as well. Um, yeah, and that's a pretty good deal. And it doesn't like put you obligate you to write a piece expressly for the contest. Compositions do not have to be written expressly for the contest. So if you've got a good piece that you've got a good recording of, you can send it in there. It doesn't say anything about can't be premiered or any of that stuff that you often see. So the, 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 the question I have is for why why um. It seems like premature to have a student competition. They're still students. I, I so. think that too. And, and, and in fact, they they say that this the series is going to be called uh, 
2012 Parma Anthology of Music Student Edition. And I don't know if I would go into a record store and say, you know what CD I want? The one that says Student Edition. <laughs> well, okay. But Even wait, this is going to I'm sorry, go ahead, Danny. What, what's a record store? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent question. Uh, well, if it weren't students, you still wouldn't go into a record store and buy this composition competition CD. Well, it doesn't. Probably so the CD not. doesn't That's, say competition. It says anthology. It's, but it's not. It's not about who's going to buy a CD. It's about what is that. That that's going to be really excellent for that composer to send that around to the next concert. Right. What I think you're really getting at it is hopefully a really well done recording, and that's the, the to me the gold <laughs> standard of any composerly activity is getting a good recording. Yeah, it really is. So um, I mean, but what like. If winning these competitions, if, if part of it is having a good recording of your piece, and then your your reward is to get a good recording of the piece, that seems a little you, strange. Too. You can in, you can submit an MP3 or a MIDI recording yeah. of the piece. Yeah, the MIDI. Recording yeah, but everybody is knows a MIDI nobody, recording is kind of a kiss of death. I mean, right. Like, yeah. Right. Nobody Unless you're super whiz bang at making finale performances. Right. Which I've heard some really good ones, but then that's like a whole other in composerly endeavor in and of itself. Right. That that I have more problems with because I feel like that gets you a false sense of what works. Oh, mm -hmm. I've 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 <laughs> lectured younger composers about you know uh, the clarinet section A is not going to be able to play that rhythm interlocked for that long without messing up, and B they don't have reverb on them when they're just playing in the hall. Well, at right. least not. That much reverb. And, and right. they have to breathe. Yeah, and they have to breathe, etc. <laughs> I mean, you know, again, all of this is kind of academic because, you know, what all, all a contest is good for the sort of the next contest. But what you want as a composer is to have your music played often and well, right? Right. And have out there and have your have you your, you become a composer in in the world rather than a composer in your room. Yeah. Um, and so. Anything that pushes you that direction is probably to your benefit, and I and I get the merit of all of these competitions. And this one doesn't sound any better or worse than any other competition. Right. You know, it's it's nice to have a to have your recording on a CD. It's nice to be able to use that as a very nice looking calling card for you know if you want to have that piece played again or another piece played or something like that. People tend to look. I mean, look, you look at a CD, and the the professionally done one looks nicer than the home cooked one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. It looks like that person is a little more serious. Whether you think that or whether that's just a subliminal thought, it's true. So yeah. the, 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 the produced record that looks great is going to get as more attention. Just like the produced score that looks great is going to get better than the scribbled score. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I, everybody knows that. So this is, these, are not, these are not mysteries. It's not going to make that composer or that record label any money. They're doing a service, the record right. label. I, I do wish so, yeah. it wasn't called Student Edition. I, I feel like if you think this is good music, it's good music no matter who wrote it. Uh, and and it's, it's worth listening to for, for anybody. And I, I think that's the, something that's, that's missing uh, from this, this, this uh, anthology that they're putting out. Well, well, why do you think they call it that? They, they want to draw attention to that these composers are young and not old fogies. Which, that, there, there's a huge problem. I mean, that's the truth of the matter, though. I mean, like, why yeah. would you have a student composer competition in the first place? But this whole rush to discover the next thing early is part of the. It's part of a a, a, a weird trend that's happening now, which is this idea of, of who who can we find? Get, who can we get while we're young? Who can we get behind before everybody gets behind them, or something like that? It's starting to feel a lot like pop music when you put it that way. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh... And look, anyway. we could have a 12-hour conversation about this that I, I probably should, shouldn't even have. Well, I think probably Parma Records, you have to realize that one of the things they're going to be doing is trying to figure out a way to build a fan base or build a user base, people yeah. that know they're there. And you put this contest out to a bunch of doctoral students in composition. Those are the future, hopefully, one would think, the composition professors who are then going to know what Parma Records is, and that, I think, is what they're after more than anything else. Right, 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 mm -hmm. sure. And then but those whatever. people are going to pay Parma to record their next album. Right. So anyway, uh, an invitation to compose is a contest. Another invitation to compose might come in a more elegant fashion, would you say, Dave? <laughs> I, I think so. New Music Box has started a new project called Sound Ideas, 
Um, it's kind of like Sound Notion. Yeah, That's what I was thinking when I read it. Like, that sounds familiar. Have a right there. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. Um, Sound Ideas is... We're pretty a new, litigious uh, people here at Sound Notion. Right. Yeah, we had trademark on sound so-and-so. Um, yeah, basically, some uh, master composers is what they're calling them on the music box. And the first one is John Luther Adams are mm-hmm. going to write a series of prompts, prompts that are supposed to inspire you to actually hold, wait for it, write music, which I think is, is pretty good idea. Yeah. They, 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 I think they probably, somebody must have pointed out to them, like you guys spend all this time writing about music and, and writing about people that make music. Do you ever make any music? And they thought to themselves, hmm, maybe we should do something about that. Um, so I think this is a very exciting thing. Um, I, when I read that they were going to start doing this uh, a week or two ago, I thought that sounds fun. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to start doing some of these. And this first one didn't really, didn't really do it for me, but um, there was one line that I really liked um, when he's talking about, he starts off with a very simple reference to Lamont Young who says, draw a straight line and follow it. And he kind of plays with this metaphor about what this, line might be or how this line that you're going to portray musically might come from your life uh and then as a almost as he feels like a throwaway line he says alternately alternatively you might remain in one place and let the lines come to you i thought that was cool that's my strategy at parties there you go <laughs> <laughs> he's a real so anyway in the one um, place is where the the alcohol is being served right, right. Yeah, or the snack. yeah yeah. If there is anyone okay. out there who has decided, uh, who uh, has feelings about this, it's gonna, it, it wants to enter, uh, we're going to be keeping our eyes open, too. So getting a sound notion mention is in your future if you actually write one of these things. I would there, be willing to bet. There are a few people who have have linked to things that they've made in the comments. So check those out. If, if, if On our site, we'll have links to all of these uh, stories that we're talking about, soundnotion.tv slash sn. <laughs> And if you scroll down to the comments, the, the very first one, here's a piece written today entitled Four Lines <coughs> That I Hope Meets the Intent of Sound Ideas. So there's one, there's at least a couple there already. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I'm going to try to participate in these uh, as yeah, often as too. I can. We should yeah, all do I it. Think... Let's, all, let's all agree to do it next week. Okay. Short, <laughs> short piece. No matter what the prompt is. Yes. Uh-huh. I am an well, I am a composer who I, works I in isolation a, and hates all the sound. I have a I have a strange opinion about this, which is like I love John Luther Adams, right? I think he's right. a great composer, um, and I like I like the the variety of composers that they've picked. It seems very made to have a variety of style, um, which is also excellent and should is shouldn't have gone into the decision process. But it seems like a weird audience to um, to. Like, if you're reading New Music Box, do you need uh, a, a kick in the ass to compose? Was my question about the whole notion. And I could, if it's helping somebody, then it's working. You guys think it's effective and you're going to go and make some pieces with the prompts and get in on the dialogue of it all? That's that's totally working. But, I, you know, when you're saying, let's all do it next week, I'm like, when? Like, yeah. I already have, <laughs> you know, I've already got a, uh, I've got a lot of music. Right already. Yeah, right. It's like, yeah, and again, you know, I'm, you're speaking to somebody who's a little older with a baby, uh, yeah. who had limited free time. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not well, in that, you know, that le- that slightly more luxurious position of, of being able to just compose because it's fun. Right. Um, <clears throat> but it seems like a, it seems like the the people who would read New Music Box probably are the least people who need the inspiration to compose least. I could be wrong. I don't. And, and I, I don't totally. Think- I don't think I'm willing to approach... admit that, that that's kind of a weird thing, but uh, again, uh, I, I I that was my thought when I read the when I read the that it was coming and I read the article and I and I love New Music Box and I have nothing bad to say about it honestly, um, but it just it struck me as like wow the people who read this are the people who are already composing usually, and maybe it's for the people right. who are new at it or or who are students or who are younger and just checking it out and it might be a really interesting way to get those people. To give them that prompt, that that a commission or a, 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 a an expectation or a performance coming up or a recording coming, whatever you we all need to get our ass to to work, right. um, maybe they don't have that as much, and so that might help them. I can see why this would be helpful, and when it's coming from on high like it is, 
right, uh, right. that that might also be interesting and it was interesting to read and get to know what john luther adams who i admire a great deal would say about if given this question that, i think to it's me, a was part, the more interesting idea i think it's part about getting people i mean it, it, I think that the the prompt part to actually you know prod you to do it is only a part of it. I think the other thing that you mentioned is is being a part of this conversation. Yeah, um, the is, discussion is, is is I think the the more interesting thing to me is mm -hmm. is to be a part of a, a discussion where a group of people have all kind of started from this same thing, and you see where each person goes, and you can have a conversation about how those people are treating. A similar idea and i think and a that simple idea. what and a simple idea yeah and i think that helps you to maybe learn something about the way other musicians think about music which is i think a very valuable thing yeah, it's kind of like commenting on a post but in a musical way yeah, sure so I, I don't feel any pressure to come up with anything more than 30 seconds of something at the moment right that's what i was thinking right so oh, okay. see, i was still pressured to come up with a huge <laughs> no, this. I was thinking of this as like, you know, sitting down for a, an afternoon maybe and seeing what happens. And to me, that's where the dialogue comes because, like, if John Luther Adams is suggesting uh, the simplicity of one line as a way to start, it's interesting. Like, I just opened up the first um, example, and it's some sort of crazy violin piece that you can, you know, it's it's not. It's just going to be interesting to see what different composers think one simple line is or whatever yeah. the next concept is. You see, it's like the strings and the lines between the fingers. And then it's just begging <laughs> for a remix project after a whole right. bunch of time. Yeah, now, that's, now we're talking. <laughs> Take all the different... Spend the rest of our lives on these projects alone. That's yeah. right. I can <laughs> remix the remixes, that kind of thing. You can right. write the string parts to it. There you oh, go. Yeah, <laughs> or the rap. Or you might call it a, uh, a, a oh, I can't remember the word, the, uh, uh, what they use in an opera. Libretto. Oh, the libretto. They use in an opera. Not the rap, What the they use in an opera. <laughs> Sam Mercier's, ladies and gentlemen. That's right. The talking part in the opera. Yeah. You know, the thing with the words and the stuff. And the right. Yeah. So. So, all right. so next Dave? week, yeah. So, that's all so, I have to say. What? Sorry. That's all I have to say about that. So next, <laughs> this we've got uh, another story uh, in the doc this this week. Uh, Nat Evans is a New York based composer, and he's actually the one that sent this to us. So so thank you, Nat. I think it's a, a pretty interesting project. <coughs> um, and now I cannot find the link to it. Um, EightVansMusic.com. You can find it there. I don't see it on the, the list of stories at all. Anyway. It's in the doc chat. Uh, man. So uh, Nat Evans is, is working on a very cool project uh, where you download a recording beforehand and put it on an iPod or some other music player, and everybody meets in the same place, and it is kind of uh, – it, it seems like it's intended to be an underscore for, like – the things that are happening around you and it's kind of a concert you know in the sense that everyone is listening to the same thing at the same time at the same rate um mm -hmm. but that other people could be there and not know that there was a concert going on which i think is an interesting idea um yeah. and this is kind of similar this is a little bit like a flash mob but it's only for the people that are involved. <laughs> like it's not presenting anything to anyone else. It's um, introspective flash mobbing. That's exactly. That's a good name for it. It's a very introspective flash mob. Um, and so the first of these is uh, April twenty fourth. So if you go to natevansmusic.com, you can you can find the recordings uh, and download them and join join the party uh, in in about a month. You guys have any thoughts on on this uh, kind of concert experience? So, does it include more instructions than so? This first one on April twenty fourth, we're supposed to download <clears throat> and then go go listen to it at sunset or sunrise, or so everybody I I... everybody downloads the track to a player and meets at one place, and then I I guess there's some kind of queue where everyone is supposed to start okay. playing it. So everyone's listening to it starting at the same time. It's pretty neat because it kind of 
takes into account the the time or the time of day and then also the place and making that part of the piece and working in the environmental sounds and everything it seems seems pretty neat yeah i think that's a really cool idea yeah sounds fun yeah 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 i mean we've talked about this kind of thing before and i think it's a great idea i mean this is uh i don't have a place to get my music performed well here you go if you're having any troubles just do this yeah this is the kind of thing where I, I I investigated a little bit about Matt Evans, and this is the kind of thing where if this was all that guy did, it was this kind of stuff, I might be a little more like, eh, you know. But I hate saying this kind of thing, but he's, quote, a real composer also, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, you know uh -oh. what else you could do if you were having problems getting your works performed is you could just become a famous actor. True. Oh! Oh! <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> and and you could star in such such classic films as uh silence of the lambs that's right and uh anthony hopkins has done just that um he's he's got uh an album that came out a, a few weeks ago uh called is it just called composer composer uh of of his original <laughs> compositions some um, of which have been used in soundtracks for movies that he has been in and directed <laughs> directed yes you so, know he, you don't need nobody to else. That's right. <laughs> so one man band. Hey, can need, you a, a need a performance arena today? for my my piece. Oh, I'll just make a movie for it to be in. Right. I mean that that makes perfect sense. Right. <laughs> Might have been the other way around. When, Might when have been. Happened. <laughs> Dave, uh, can you can you wait, play Jim, a couple do you, clips? Do you have any of the music that you can yes. play? Yeah. Play, okay. play track five. Play track, track five. Track five. Okay. <laughs> it's the most interesting one to me. It's called America, but with a K. Now, speaking of remix projects, that's oh, like man. perfect. Chop that up into some chunks. <laughs> Telling you, you got yourself a, mi a middle school band piece in like three hours. So it's yeah. pretty. It's pretty or romantic. Is that is that from a movie? No, but it sounds uh, like it could be, right? I mean, I'm just, I was just asking if that was used to 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 you know swell a particular scene or it, not. It, it sounds like a horse chase or something. <laughs> I mean, I've heard worse music. Right. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. It's 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 not bad music. And I like the idea stretch. that Anthony Hopkins likes to compose music. You know? Well, right. that, that's that's the that's the gimmick of it all is that somebody yeah. who doesn't normally do this is now doing this. Yeah. Right. And, um, it, 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 so is this any? And I I'm not I'm not going to weigh in. I just want to pose a question to the to the to the. <laughs> is this any different than uh, say a famous rock star doing this? Or a, a a famous indie rock star doing this exact. Like, Are you referring to like someone like Paul McCartney? Well, okay, or we John everybody knows Paul McCartney, and let's leave him alone for a minute. <laughs> okay. It's too crass of an example. We all we all are probably thinking the same thing about Paul McCartney's classical music, who who's made a point of of not learning very much about what he's doing, and and who has who has done this on the strength of his name and his talent. He's not untalented. And again, I've, I've listened to the whole Liverpool oratorio and it sounds like this weird orchestral version of, of some Beatles songs. That's, that's a little bland. Um, and if the worst we can say about it is a little bland or it's crass or it's, he's involved a lot of other people to write it down or anything like that. Um, he's, he's the, he's the immediate bad counter example. Mm -hmm. right? But like, think about all of the, all of the, everything that's going on now when we want to hear um from uh from anybody who was in battles or the books or anything like that or mm -hmm. uh, you know elvis costello uh or um i mean help me out there's we can all well last week we listened to johnny greenwood his new yeah. album the, with know. pieces by him and penderecki and so, and I, go ahead i'm saying like is is this any is this any different that, and somebody who's using their 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 renown or their name brand in one place to put forth music that they've written. No, I don't think so. 
But I, I wouldn't so. I wouldn't make it analogous to the Johnny Greenwood example in because Johnny Greenwood's music is really interesting and not like this music, you know. There's nothing to get this music published and on a CD if your name is not Anthony Hopkins. Sure. I think sure. Johnny Greenwood, you could make the same argument, but you know, it's really interesting forward-looking music. It's not this, this rehash of romantic sounds. Sure. Um, so we're objecting to the quality of the music and he wouldn't have gotten there without being who he was. That's correct. I, I would make it more analogous to like um you know, Eddie Murphy coming out with Boogie in Your Butt or Don Johnson releasing a single in the 80s, you know, when they were big stars. And he, Eddie Murphy knows all I have to do is make a song that you can dance to and put my name on it, and it's a hit. And it was, you know. Yeah. I, w I would say it's more analogous to that kind of that. I'd be curious to know how well this particular record is selling. Oh, I looked on, 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 uh, on Amazon, and I can't remember it, but it said order, order more because... Or order soon because we're almost out. Kind of message. That's that's what it was like so two people, days ago. You know, I mean, like again, you know, we looking on Amazon is always a misleading thing because fans of Anthony Hopkins probably don't know how to get onto LimeWire and download it. <laughs> you know, so when we see who's the top selling classical artist on Amazon, it's always a very misleading sure, quotient. Yeah. You know, and I don't know. I mean, like, a certain I, of CDs. So I haven't listened to the records. So I'm talking out out uh, out of school here, but um, I don't have the hugest problem with it. No, um, I don't either. And I, and I, I think it. it's really cool that there's somebody that that thinks it's an interesting enough. I I mean, no matter no matter what your opinion of his music, it's taken him enough time to learn how to put something like this together. And I I I've always been kind yeah, of inspired by amateur musicians who who don't do don't make any money from what they're doing but you know we appreciate how much work it is to put something like that together um, we're getting that feedback from you again Danny oh really yeah I didn't I didn't touch anything well I, I don't know <laughs> I'll turn down the volume over. sometimes it just happens um but anyway um, this this obviously isn't Anthony Hopkins trying to make a quick buck or anything, or like right. Right. he doesn't I mean, need a quick buck. Right. Exactly. So I mean, like he's doing this out of a, out of a passion for <laughs> music, which is which here's is great. The, the question I always have is how much help does he have yeah. doing? Yeah. Like, how mean? much? How, what? I'm how sorry. Much, how much help? Like are between yeah. what we hear and and uh, Yeah, and that's the kind of thing that for for somebody like this is, gets pretty well hidden. Uh, right. who knows? He, he, maybe not even more than some of the best film composers. Well, okay. Now that that this is this is where people actually don't usually have um, the right information about these things. And I, 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 this is a great moment I can set a particular record straight. Um, in that I know uh, Danny Elfman, who is usually the first accused composer, who, as we all know, or maybe you don't, was a big rock star when he started. Mm -hmm. is no longer a big rock star. Nobody knows who Oingo Boingo is anymore that's not of a certain age. <laughs> um, but at the time when, when I remember him as a stadium selling out rock star who got selling, who, who started working with Tim Burton writing music and, uh, and <clears throat> honey, he's a friend of mine and I've seen how he works. He actually showed me how he works. And either, either what he did was a very elaborate show for me, which why the hell would he put on an elaborate show for me? Um, uh, or that, that is a guy who does write every note, even though he's not, he's been accused of, of not doing it. And like, he's, he, he does have help because every film composer has help and it's never because they can't do it. It's because they can't do it in the time allotted. Right. So that, that's a, that's a whole different matter. Like a film composer, like some of them, I mean, again, again, Hans Zimmer apparently writes 20 minutes of music and farms it out. And so the Hans Zimmer the school of Hans Zimmer, much like the school of Caravaggio, comes up with the entire finished product, right? Right. But, uh, you know, in, in film <laughs> music, I think we just all understand that that's part of the game. And, and a lot of times those people are credited uh, as as so somehow assisting in, in the score preparation. Um, and for something like this, they, they wouldn't be. You know, the, the way that a ghostwriter of, um, you know, Sarah Palin's memoirs is not credited. I mean, is is somebody credited in, in the liner notes of Sir Anthony's record? Is my is my question. I that may be. I don't know. Because I remember when Billy Joel came out with his piano music. 
Remember this? The classical piano music thing? Seas and Delusions, yeah. I believe it was called. Yeah. Um, and in, in the liner notes for that, for piano, a record of just piano music was credited three arrangers. <laughs> um, now, I don't know what those arrangers did. I have no idea, but in, in, a, in a, like, it's not like an orchestra piece where you might need some arrangers or, you yeah. know, you put it on a computer and you just need somebody to, like, double the bassoons or figure out how to, like, take your string pits's sound and your string arco sound and make it into a single part or yeah, these kind Billy, of things. Billy Joel is probably pretty familiar with how things lay on the piano, I would imagine. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but but again, who are these? Yeah. Maybe they were the people that helped him write it down. I mean, I don't know what, what yeah. they did. They helped him pick which piano to play it on. Sorry? Crap. They helped him pick which piano to play it on. That's what it was. <laughs> who knows? I mean, again, these are all, these are all very mysterious processes. Sometimes it seems like a record label is is looking to make a quick buck, but maybe the artist himself isn't. Well, well I'm, sh I'm sure the record label is is, make, is looking to make a quick buck on this. And if you're curious about Sir Anthony's music, you can you can find it on apparently Amazon and other places where fine Anthony Hopkins music is sold. Right, <laughs> and if you want to unravel this story and any other story that perplexes the world of art, we've got the answer for you. We do. We do. There is a, currently a search on for North America's best arts blogger. Who is this, uh, <laughs> this is a contest being sponsored by a the Spring for music, music Festival. Yeah, the Spring for Music Festival. So they're having a contest with a twenty-five hundred dollar prize for uh, the best blo arts blogger. Um, and we're going to have a link, and you can look at all the parameters. Um, I, first of all, think this is a completely ridiculous idea. Why, Sam? <laughs> There's, well, this is as ridiculous or even more possibly than when Daddy was talking about getting a pile of 700 scores and trying to figure out who's the, quote, best composer in that pile of scores. Yeah. Um, well, I just don't know. I just don't know that there's a need to come up with what we might want to call the best arts blog. You know, it's, also it's, there's there should be a distinction I hope between people who do it for pay and not for pay. This is and, kind of one of the problems. They don't have a, a distinction. For example, if he wanted, Alex Ross could have entered this contest. Correct. Or and, Jeremy and Dank. Or Jeremy Dank, right? Or or Ann Majette could have oh, wait, entered is, this contest. Is Jeremy Dank paid to do his blog, or is that something he's doing as a volunteer? No, but he he well, does get he's paid done some to write. Editorials. I mean, like, I can't imagine he doesn't get paid when he writes an, uh, something that's published in a major publication. I mean, I, 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 look, I, I get paid to write articles, and I was also a blogger for a long time. And um, and there's a big difference between what you do for money uh, and what you do for your blog. And I feel like there are people, but like all of the, I believe, and I do not quote me on this, but do all of the people at um, Arts Journal, do they, I think they are all professional bloggers. I don't and know Kyle if they get paid or not. And Greg Sandow and Amanda Amir and are all great bloggers. But are they like are they doing it out of a volunteer passion? I don't know. Actually. I don't either. Um, but this this contest <clears throat> doesn't distinguish anybody could 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 enter it, um, which is a, one thing that's a little weird. Um, also, they have a series of prompts that you have to write to mm -hmm. um, for each oh. thing, which is a, also I think question. weird. No, it's not what you think. Say what? It's not what you think. Like it's not just looking for the. The number one arts blogger so or submit, whatever. It's like it's like having an essay contest. The round yeah, one yeah. question is: New York has long been considered the cultural capital of America. Is it still? If not, where? Which is not a, comp a terribly sophisticated question, and it, to me, it's really easy to write circles about without saying anything. Right. I mean, you're either going to take a stand and say New York is, or you're going to take a stand and say it's somewhere else. Um, just as a side note, I would say that the internet is the cultural. So I, I would say that Prospect Heights, Brooklyn, is the culture. There you go. <laughs> there you go. I was in Michigan. Yeah. yeah, that's right. I'm gonna win. I'm gonna win this one. I got. I got this one. <laughs> So yeah. we did not enter for for many reasons. One because the it's, passed. one because it's dumb, and the other <laughs> was that you had to register by Wednesday of this week of this past week, and then have your first post up by Friday of this past week, and we only record on Sundays. Um, <laughs> now, I think it's dumb, but you think that I'm going to check in and see who wins? Absolutely. So, kudos <laughs> to Spring for Music. 
they're, so, they're controlling well, look, there by behavior. Of, there, so, th like I said before, when we talked about composition contests, there's nothing inherently bad, I don't think, about recognizing people that are doing good work. No, and, it's, it's, it's essentially rewarding somebody for what ought to be a volunteer effort. Sure. You know, um, and that's, I think, I, I mean, it's not like, it's not saying once you do this, you are now a, a, a taste maker. We were going to give you a job at New Yorker magazine. Your, your blog will be here, here, and here. It's just giving somebody a little bit of cash for, for excellent work done. It's a, you know, I don't know if it's going to be an annual thing or a one-off thing, but, you know, it's kind of dumb maybe, but it's not that dumb. I've certainly, there's certainly dumber things one can enter. It's a little, I think, condescending. First of all, I think separating bloggers from real <coughs> writers is a little condescending because there are a lot of bloggers that produce some some very good writing um, that is, oh, is totally. very engaging and compelling uh, and, and thoughtful that's as thoughtful or more thoughtful than something that you might read in any major publication. Um, and so I think it's, it's a little condescending in that sense uh to to throw out just this 25 2500 dollar prize and that's it um but i also think that the, the best way to do this would just be to have people submit their blog as it is and then not necessarily pick a winner but then have them say here's some really good stuff you should read this stuff you give away 2500 <laughs> bucks that way though that's but it's like any other essay contest in a way yeah. like you know what is America? Write a thousand mm -hmm. words on that, and they'll judge the writing on that. They're right, just right. using the word blog, right? But it, it's basically an essay contest, or right? Merriam-Webster like, defines have America a blog as of the into the content. well. Right. That's it, it is an essay contest, but making a good blog post is not just. It's mainly, but not just about being able to write well. It's about making a good blog post, and there's a few other things like how it's formatted, how it looks, that kind of stuff. I wonder if, right. since they're calling it a blog competition, they're going to do part of the judging based on how your information is presented on your blog site. Right? Well, let's I'd like, let's I'd like hope to say that whoever's running this is heeding all of our very important and well-weighed words and yeah. will improve the contest for the next iteration. Right. So that's and they, they've, we're not the only people that have said this is a little bit silly. Um, yeah. There, well, there've been Tim, a lot of uh, a lot of back and forth. In, Tim in Rosenberg in the blogs. chat. Tim Rosenberg in the chat says, "I think music blogging and arts blogging is mediocre at best. Anything that raises the level even a little bit is a good thing." Well, well that's a that. Who said that? A guy in our chat room. Well, that's that that that's like saying all this can do that. You're automatically wrong if you if you make a blanket statement that like. That arts blogging okay. as a general rule is 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 mediocre because it's not. It was actually Tim I mean, Rosenberg, who's who's the host of another show on on Sound Ocean TV, that said that. <laughs> He's very cynical and he almost hates everything more than me. Really, I wouldn't go yes. that far. <laughs> the 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 fact that the fact that they're trying to figure out a way to fold writing about art into a festival that is about art. You know, to me, it's not a bad thing. I just don't think they found quite the best way to make it click yet. But as Danny yeah. said, hopefully they'll make it better. Yeah, but like the first year of any competition, there's probably a lot of things they have to iron out. You know, they've gotten sure they've gotten funding from somewhere to have a competition. They're probably doing it in a in a in the most painless way they can think of to get the first one off the ground and to get the conversation about it going. Yeah. You know, hopefully it will get refined if there is a further iteration of it. Hopefully it will bring some good piece of writing so we can all read and have a conversation about it. This is the whole idea of creating an uh, impetus to add to the next of what they think is an important topic. Um, right. If, so if you view it as just like, you know, why is New York the center of the cultural world? If not, why not? Or where it is or whatever. That is, that is one of those simple prompts, like saying, let the lines come to you. There's a lot to be said on that. And it's so broad that it will be interesting to see what, the people who decide to weigh in on it actually say. Right. And I feel like before we hate the, the sin, let's see what the sinners are. You know, mm -hmm. let's see who the people are, what, and let's see what wins. And like, let's not judge the competition until it has been carried through. Right. Because it may bring to light something that we all need. Yeah. And, and, and there are actually a couple of blogs that are in my reader right now, my RSS reader right now, that are doing the, the, the competition. And I read their, their <coughs> posts about the, the New York 
scene uh and i i thought they were pretty interesting um and, and s- some of them very well written so uh i think they plan to link to all of these different entries um and so if nothing else this will be an opportunity for for me to grow my list of rss feeds that that i read each week right um, right which is how we learn everything right mm-hmm. right yeah. So yeah, that that I that in itself could be valuable. Um, so we're hoping next year they they kind of make things a little more more open. Uh, I also hope that next year they will let allow submissions uh, include submissions from multimedia people like us. <laughs> yeah, um, arts video podcasting. Right, just... there needs that, to be a category we... for new music video podcast. Yes. Uh, I think I think we could do I very well in guys, that. I think we got a real chance. <laughs> yeah. Could I could I could there be a category for new music video podcast repeat guest? Yes. Yes, there you go. That'll be down to like you and maybe three other people. Yeah. Okay. That those are the odds I can handle. Yeah. yeah. I, I think I think you I think you'd do pretty well there. All right. Uh, yeah, come on third time and I think well, if you're listening, spring, spring for, for music. music. Yeah. You you got you got it. Um, should we probably, we want to skip on to the, to the pick We're we've been going along a little bit. Yeah. Oh, well, let's just mention real quick. There's a program in New York called face the music. That is let's a, let's talk about it next week. Okay. Let's talk about I face do, the music next week. I want to mention this one, the last article, just because I don't want to talk about it at all next week unless sure. something else happens, uh, in our now six part series or whatever it is on <laughs> female composers. Um, we've been talking about this a lot lately. Uh, uh, last week we mentioned that Amy Beth Kirsten wrote a long response to Rob Deemer's list of female composers. She obviously has some very strong ideas about that. She wrote an article for New Music Box this week called The Woman Composer, in quotations, is dead. And she has some very strong feelings about it. But more important than that, there are like three yards of, competi- of uh, comments below this blog post and i read a huge chunk of them and they're very thoughtful and you see a lot of women's names down there which is a good thing so if you're interested in staying engaged with the talk about gender inequality and composition and new music in general uh visit this new music box article the woman composer is dead by amy beth kirsten we'll have a link in the show notes speaking of things that are dead that particular horse on this particular show yes (laughs) um now moving on to the pick of the week the pick, pick of, of the week. week. <laughs> the pick of the week this week is a recording uh, that, that that Danny shared with us just this morning, uh, called "All Tomorrow's Parties," and it has it, this file the title has "Puro" in parentheses afterwards. You want to uh, introduce this piece to us a little bit, Danny? Yeah, I did. A, I wrote a uh, when I was uh, uh, about 10, 12 years ago, <coughs> a piano piece um, called "Down to You Is Up." Um, and it was all based on three uh, Velvet Underground tunes in various ways. Um, <clears throat> so then I, I, I uh, expanded the first movement out uh, a lot to this Piero Ensemble version of, uh, of All Tomorrow's Parties. I love that song, and I particularly love uh, the, uh, John Cale's piano in that song. Um, and I thought I just had to have it in my own way. So... <clears throat> this is not trying to sound like the Velvet Underground. This is just sort of my reaction to that piece, and, it, and it's and it scored for Piero Ensemble. All right. Well, let's take a listen. We're we're uh, probably not going to listen to the whole thing. Um, we usually only listen to about thirty to sixty seconds. Um, so <coughs> I guess we'll just, we'll just start at the beginning. Uh, and this is uh, all tomorrow's parties. Danny Felsenfeld. And who's performing here? This is, these are members of the uh, Syracuse Symphony Orchestra. Excellent. Excellent. All tomorrow's party.
All right, so that was an excerpt from All Tomorrow's Parties by our guest, Daniel Fosenfeld. Thanks for sharing that with us. Hey, my pleasure. <coughs> I, I, I don't know if that's how it sounded to you guys, but to me it sounded like um, like a 70s nature documentary. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds almost working. Oh, it sounds better uh, it sounds, in the recording. Okay. Sorry, it sounds different here than no, it does No, I like 70s there. nature documentaries. <laughs> it's a new direction for the piece, yeah. We should we should yeah. have warned you that it sounds a little different on the on the program than it does going back into Skype. I was I was excited by it. I it was cool. <laughs> but uh I really like the rhythmic drive you got going there. I mean <clears throat> as far as instrumentation is concerned, I mean was that was there any what was the idea behind, you know, putting different parts of the Piero ensemble in different places that would you know, for example, be re repetitive in the piano or, you know, what, whatever repetitive might mean to you. But um... well, well, I mean, like there's the, in, in the song, right, in, in All Tomorrow's Parties, there, it's, a, it's a much slower song than that. But um, but there's this kind of very boomy, roomy, gorgeous, like weird piano sound that I just loved. Um, and so I wanted to, to kind of capture that a little bit. Um, and using the piano as, as the drive. And I find like when you have something that has a, if you want to have something that's driving, if you have somebody kind of constantly keeping the, the pulse, um, it's, it's, I mean, I, I'm not the first one to come up with this, obviously, um, but it's, it, it does keep, it, it, it does cohere the piece. So the piano is sort of where it all starts, but by no means does it stay that. It, you know, it, it, it drops out, it has other more subsidiary roles, and I, and I do try to push the pulse around the ensemble a little bit. Originally, this was done for the Robin Cox Ensemble. Both of these ensembles, sadly, I mentioned the Syracuse Symphony and Robin Cox, I was just uh, thinking are now that. no longer with us. Um, but I wrote, I wrote a version. He liked the piece and wanted a, wanted a, a larger version. And but his ensemble is a little different. So I made a Piero version to have a little more standard play. Yeah. Um, and I'm excited to to tell you that this group Red Shift, which is an amazing group of New York freelancers. Uh, it's going to be. We're, I'm, we're putting this out on a record next year with Red Chef. This and, piece. And which, and which version people. is that? The Piero version. This okay. version. Cool. And do you <clears throat> do you have any idea about when that's going to be available? I don't. Okay. Well, <laughs> sometime we'll, 2013. Don't let us it. know. We'll link to it. Uh, we'll come back and, and change this to link to <laughs> yeah, that. Be, is there anywhere yeah. anybody can listen to this recording online anywhere? Danny. You're welcome to an impact. It'll be on Naxos in 2013. Okay, but there's there's no no nobody can go anywhere to listen to this that we just listened to. No, sorry. Okay. So, soon enough, my website will be up and we'll have much music on it available. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We should we should have pointed that out actually. The 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 URL that we've been putting down here for for Danny is is not live yet. Uh, it's as we semi live. This. It's half live. Yeah. It's like oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but there's no there's none of my music on it. But that'll happen in the next couple of weeks. So. Excellent. Come back and, and see it Excellent. sometime. Well, like. we're, we're already running pretty long, so I think we should probably wrap this up. Uh, the you danger know? of having me on the show as I talk about <laughs> this, No, we love actually, it. Actually, the last yeah. time you were on the show was also one of our longer episodes. <laughs> 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 and and that's not a bad thing. We're, 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 we're happy to have you, and, we're, we're, and when we have a good conversation, we're happy to go a little long. So thanks for yeah, joining I, us. I, I, hey, I did have one question. If sure. Is there anywhere we could... Uh, like, say want somebody wanted to play this music, e either of these two versions. Is there somewhere we could get the score or just contact you directly? Or you could just write me at <laughs> bellsin at mac dot com, and I would happily send a score and whatever. Okay, great, thanks. Excellent. For now, soon it'll be on Fells and Music, and that'll all be that'll all be uh, easier to come by. Excellent. Excellent. Right now, I'm 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 way I'm so indie that I don't even have a website. That's how indie. Oh I'm. man, <laughs> totally unplugged except so for hip. Skype. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta come over. I'll have it. <laughs> <laughs> and he'll write it out for you. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'll sit, stay up all night with a quill. Right. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Thanks. Do you have any last minute stuff? I know we talked about a couple of things uh, earlier, but and if you repeat stuff, that's fine. That you want to plug before we head out? Well, I'm doing some arrangements for. Um, there's a show uh, on the 19th and 20th at BAM called Shuffle Culture, which uh, <laughs> features uh, Mirror, aka Quest Love from the Roots, and it also features. A bunch of beatboxers and Reggie Watts and Sasha Gray, and I'm doing some arrangements for that. Um, oh, so that should be that should be a really hip show. Again, Shuffle Culture at BAM. Um, it's got the Metropolis Ensemble, uh, who I'm also working with, uh, and we'll have a big show in October with Metropolis, and 
I have a lot of stuff coming up next year, next season, but right now it's it's a uh, the libretto reading is just the cool thing, which is on April twelfth at the Cell Theater. Excellent. And so that that reading's public. Yeah, that's that's public. Excellent. So if if you're in the New York area, you should definitely check that out. I I, <laughs> I can only imagine that it will be life changing. I think it's fair to say. <laughs> um, well, the libretto I should mention is by L.A. writer Kate Gale, uh, who is a wonderful libretto, and the the subject is uh is uh is the Dr. Kinsey and his his group. Um, not a dissimilar trajectory to that movie about him. Um, Which was a pretty good movie, I thought. I loved it. I loved it. Yeah. Um, and it's sort of it's sort of oddly similar in scope and uh, and and angles. So it's just and it's going to be an opera I'll be writing in the next couple of years. Oh. And and obviously the way to become the next huge action star all over the world is to make a movie about Kinsey, and then Liam Neeson thereafter is like doing nothing but killing bad guys. And since I'm, since that time, I'm looking to become an action star from the opera. Hence the beard. <laughs> yeah, hence the beard, and, and so Sir Anthony Hopkins and I could have a chat. That's right. I could maybe start right. in some movies. Oh, yeah, speaking of which, we have to stop broadcasting. We're not done with the show yet. <laughs> oh, hurry up. You keep interrupting me. All right. This has been Sound Notion. Thank you all so much for joining us. I especially want to thank everyone that's watching live. We record this show and stream it live every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. ish Eastern time. Uh, I want to thank the people that joined us in the chat room. CK Rocker, Jess Ryan 08, and Tim Rosenberg. Thank you so much for being a part of our conversation. Uh, we are watching the chat room, even though we don't always, uh, at least I don't often have time to type yeah. in it. We are watching it, so thank you so much uh, for, for being a part of our conversation. Uh, if you would like to do that again in the future, uh, again, 11 a.m. Sundays, Eastern Time, and you can find the stream at soundnotion.tv slash live. If you're watching this after the fact and you would like to uh, comment on – uh, the show, any of the things we've talked about, or if you want to find links to the stories that we talked about, you can do that again on our website, soundnotion.tv slash SN. You'll find this episode there. Um, we would also encourage you to continue this conversation with us on Facebook or Twitter. On Twitter, we're at Sound Notion. All of us individually are also on Twitter, and we're happy to continue that conversation with you there. Um, this show and all our shows are available in the iTunes store, so be sure to go there and subscribe for free uh, and download every episode in video or audio format. Um, our show includes, uh, our show introduction in includes audio by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>